the, 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 the point of this fireside uh, chat, albeit absent uh, a fire, um, is to look at how open source is driving the digital decade. So we have three uh, well-versed, prominent um, open source uh, champions and also policy leaders to, to help us understand better uh, what that looks like. Um, I will introduce Marcel when he, when he joins. Um, I'm going to uh, also introduce um, uh, Henri. Uh, Mr. Profond, if you'd like to join, join me up here, I'll also introduce you. Um, and then we can get started. Now, <clears throat> in the good old fashioned open source way, if you think my questions uh, are not up to par, um, then jump in and better those questions. That's absolutely fine. Um, I will do my best not to disappoint. So, um, Henri Verdier is a digital ambassador uh, with France's Ministry of European Foreign Affairs. He's the former state CIO and a passionate entrepreneur uh, who continues to innovate in government and partnerships beyond France in multiple countries around the world. Uh, Andre uh, Profond, just sitting here to my right, is the advisor to the vice minister who we're listening to earlier, Mr. Batosh, of digitization for the Czech government and actively supporting the uh, new Czechia digital agency, otherwise known as DIA, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right. Um, a highly regarded computer scientist and member of the open source community, and as he whispered in my ear, also um, uh, um, an avid user of Fedora. Is that right? Very good. Yeah. Super. Um, okay. And I tell you what, ju just just for the sake of, of I'm I'm hoping, being the eternal optimist, that Marcel will will make it. He is he is really en route. Um, he's a member of the European Parliament. Uh, again, um, a computer scientist, indeed an, an alum, another great alum from this uh, esteemed university. He is also several years with Red Hat just up the road, and uh, he was recently elected, or three years ago, elected as an MEP for the Pirate Party, uh, involved in all sorts of policies impacting this digital decade, but also uh, a senior MEP in the, as a quester. He's also responsible for the daily IT operations. So again, with regards to what Mrs. Gaffey was discussing and mentioned, this intra-EU intra collaboration and cooperation, and it would be interesting to hear a little bit about that. Um, from um, his side, uh, Leos, I think, was one of the projects which was uh, mentioned. But there, but there are there are others. So, um, uh, Ms. Ambassador Valdier, you are you are there. You can hear me. All good. Fine. Uh, super. So, Ambassador, I'd like to turn to you uh, to talk about uh, recent work that you've been um, working very hard with your colleagues in uh, in France during the EU presidency, and this was the the uh, the Declaration of Digital Commons. Um, it seeks, of course, to build on open source as a, as a as global commons, but of course, it's much broader than that. And I think it'd be interesting, just as a context context setter, for you to perhaps just elaborate a little bit more on that initiative, uh, the steps you're taking, and also how, again, as Mrs. Gaffey mentioned earlier, how we can engage better with the community, both here in Bruno, but 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 far far beyond as well. So, um, over to you, uh, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. I'm very sad uh, not to be physically with you in Bruno. Um, the week before the UNGA is not the best week to travel <laughs> because I do organize two events in New York next week. Um, to, to make it simple and to start the exchange. Um, first, I would love to share with you my conviction that the, the digital revolution as we know it is a revolution of open standards, open source software, free software, and open data. And the stream of innovation and creativity and economic growth and citizen empowerment that we know for 50 years is, 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 is because of this open approach, decentralized, et cetera. That's one thing. The second thing is that we European, we, we didn't pay enough attention about the fact that this is a very European vision of the world and that a large part of this movement was born in Europe, if you consider uh, clearly, uh, seriously. The first works that they did conduce to TCPIP were French, HTML was invented by an Englishman in Geneva, Linux is European, Bluetooth is European, ADSL is European, and a lot of other uh, very important uh, uh, free open uh, resources. And 
we in France, we think more and more than uh, we have to stand for this legacy and maybe protect it a bit because we do observe a movement of weaponization of uh, internet uh, of some states that want to control it more and more. Uh, big monopolies built on internet that try to control a bit or to capture a bit. And we consider that Europe has to, to protect it, to, 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 to continue this movement of um, economic innovation and growth and this movement of citizen empowerment. And that may, may be the, the role of Europe. The new thing is that, as you all see, we have now for a few years these reflections, this very important reflection about European digital sovereignty. And we, France, we try to, to prove that an open source approach can be part of a digital sovereignty strategy. To make it very simple, the more you have free resources, the more you have open source software, the more you build your countries or your economy on digital commons, uh, I introduced the world then, uh, the freer you are because no one can expropriate you, nor change the prices, nor impose you uh, uh, technological uh, choices. So we, we consider that this is an important part of um, digital sovereignty strategy. That's also why we did introduce in the debate, the word uh, commons, because we are, we know, and everyone in the room knows that uh, sometimes you can have a predatory strategy, if I may, a, a capture strategy uh, through open source. Open source alone is not enough. If I open the source of my code, but I control the, the commit, <laughs> I'm still the master of the ecosystem and I can control the ecosystem. So when we speak about commons, it's, it can be a bit more like uh, that than just uh, software. It can be open standards or it can be open data. So it can be a bit broader than just software, but not every uh, open source software are, can be considered as commons. We want resources that are uh, governed by the community of contributors uh, with an open and shared governance. And um, last year, it was the French presidency of EU, and we did propose to our friends of Europe to, to launch a working group. And we actually, uh, 18 countries did join the group very easily. That was a, a first surprise because we had to align ministries of economy and finance and ministries of foreign affairs, which is not so easy in 18 countries. And we did collectively uh, prepare these reports. Uh, you know this, and uh, I hope that you. You can have a look to the report. And we are proposing a, a simple but uh, very committed strategy to EU. So this year, and with our friends of uh, Czech presidency, we'll try to promote the conclusion of the report. Uh, to make it simple, we suggest to start with very small and engaged uh, policies like uh, open by default <laughs> in the uh, European administrations. We suggest to, to think about a one-stop shop because what we did discover is that we have tons of uh, commoners, creators, innovators, and dozens of uh, tools to help them, uh, but this is a total mess. And a one-stop shop to help people to find a good way to, help, to receive money or, or support uh, can be very efficient. Uh, the third thing is to inject a, a bit uh, to, to, to give some money because we government, we always pretend to love the communities, but we don't pay enough. And uh, maybe it's time to, to invest a bit. Here, I have to say that if we consider that commons are a tool for sovereignty, it's not just commons invented in Europe. Uh, some very important piece of code are not European, but they are helpful for our sovereignty. So we have to be a bit open there. And we do suggest that it's time to, con to, to think about a one Europe European foundation, so a foundation born in Europe, because in this landscape, uh, we, you have very few foundations. Most of them are Americans. We like them, we work with them, but maybe our voice and our vision of the world and our energy uh, should contribute to this movement and to be part of the movement. I hope I didn't be too long, but that's why I want what I wanted to share with you. 
thank you, Ambassador. That was um, enlightening. I think also it's uh, important to make that very clear about uh, not all open source can be considered as open source. And I think there's never been a more important time to uh, make that clear in terms of getting the right governance, uh, the right IP, uh, using those recognized uh, permissive and copy left licensing. I think we should be on guard uh, for those who might claim to have an open source um, a distribution, but in fact it's not. And also on the point about foundations, um, of course, um, Hale in, in the audience here from the Eclipse, I think it's one such example of, of, of a foundation um, helping drive uh, open source um, in Europe, but also equally uh, beyond. Um, so I'm gonna turn to Mr. Profond, if I may. Um, again, great to have you by the proverbial fire. Um, warm your hands. Uh, let's get a little bit warmer uh, with um, uh, a question to you about something which uh, the, the minister mentioned earlier about uh, DIA um, and your um, uh, own personal involvement in that, but also the agency itself. Uh, of course, later on, uh, we're going to be uh, exploiting you again on another panel where we'll have uh, Maria from the digital agency, the, sort of the, the counterpart. It'd be good to have a bit of a, a discussion on that panel about that. But really, so how do you uh, how do you see this agency adding value? How do you see it interacting with our ag other agencies um, and really sort of driving this uh, this uh, open source policy agenda and to, as it's written, European digital decade to, to realize the European or even accelerate that realization? Thank you, Mr. Profond. I'm going to give you the, the mic. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, let me elaborate. In Czech Republic, organization of e government is pretty big house right now uh, because now it is re responsibility for ministry of interior which is basically ministry of policemen of course and uh, uh, there is no concentrate focus on digital goals because their goals are security uh, firefighters policemen not digitalization so my and my minister goals is to bring the institution with which brings a single responsibility principle so, or pretty small institution which has goal to digitalize Czech Republic to do it in high quality not just another officer's task but goals of entire institution we are very inspired by the another Czech institution, NUKIP, which uh, is a cybersecurity institution, which is uh, here in Brno. Uh, yeah. And only after the start of operation of Digital and Information Agency, IDEA, we can finally push our topics, our political topics, and uh, beliefs and goals into uh, public sector reality. Without it, it's not quite possible uh, because uh, you have these officers from the policemen and uh, they just, okay, they have some information system, they are running this operation, but there is no, no uh, goals and to the enthusiasm and other needed things to achieve something bigger. Uh, one of uh, the goals of uh, DIA is international collaboration. And of course, may, uh, one of the uh, form of inter international collaboration is at open source. We are happy that the timing is right and we can directly connect DIA with uh, now founded uh, Czech National Spot, which is now starting here in Brno. We, we wish close cooperation with India and National Spot, <coughs> like the minister said. Uh, just yesterday uh, was the first in-person meeting of EU OSPO. For me, this is the great way to connect uh, across Europe efforts in open source. And I am really like that I met a lot of new people like Maria and, uh, from Sweden and uh, much more that, uh, and we can together 
bring uh, better quality open source in public sector. It's not about quality of open source itself. It's about how to join these two worlds, these two very different worlds. Uh, there are barriers of public procurement. There are barriers of uh, culture and mentality. There are ba barriers of very high level lobbying of uh, the big vendors. And we have to, to manage this uh, in some things, in soft way, in education, in upscaling people, some things in maybe hard way, and some things in budgeting. So what we do need? Open source has wide opportunities, but of course, a competition is high. So we need a central support from EU Commission, of course. <laughs> but I think uh, Veronica Gaffey knew it that uh, there are some barriers like uh, the procurement uh, that can uh, be a little tricky in uh, adaptation of open source. And in the future, we need to talk about public procurement, which, yeah, that I say, say now. So uh, that's the, my first look at the topic. That's why we are creating our agency. And that, that is how, how we look to brighter tomorrows. Uh, thank you very much. I didn't appreciate it was the first meeting of the EU OSPO yesterday. In person. In person. Yeah. Wow, so it's a big deal. And it's somewhat sort of poignant that it took place in Bruno, which I understand correctly, but if I'm wrong, it has, in terms of ratio, open source contributed to IT professional, I think it's got the highest ratio in the world, or certainly one of the countries that right at the top of that list. So somewhat, somewhat appropriate. And then to your point about the EU support, I think that message has been fully understood and, and has been responded to in terms of this announcement about the code.europa.eu. So I think things are heading in the right direction. And, and I think this point finally on the sort of culture piece about um, inspiring and getting policemen and so on excited about open source was just their, their core comment, you know, their core job. They have another agenda. They have another agenda and another culture, yeah. So, so again, um, uh, later on perhaps uh, we talk about um, uh, Maria, if, if, uh, if as I recall, um, the Swedish police is quite is a big user of open source on the front line, and uh, and I think that's that's probably the last point I want to make on this this idea that it's not just about the code, right? Open source code. It's it, it's much wider and bigger about in terms of the culture, so sort of that passion that's needed. Uh, code and processes. The processes are important part. Uh, the processes are the difference because uh, every big corporation is very rigid and uh, uh, the state is very very big corporation and it's rigid conservative and it's hard to um, change for internal processes hard to change internal rules uh, to be reasonable but uh, uh, normal open source software do some reasonable things what we what we need to do if you want uh, to organize your calendars, calendar, you organize your calendar. It's no rocket science, but in the public sector, you can create some much more complicated things, uh, uh, right? And a lot of, a lot of uh, stoppers that stop your adaptation of pretty good software that uh, you can really use in practice but in some theory with consultation with lawyer it can be uh, much much harder can i make a two-finger comment very yes, great I, you know i was just about to come because we were talking you mentioned about um you mentioned something which which triggered my mind so i've got to bring in the ambassador on this you talked about education and upscaling so um, that's something i'd like to throw to the ambassador but before doing so ambassador the floor is yours um go ahead 
Yeah, th thank you. Now, just to add something, first to congratulate you for this mission, which is one of the most uh, amazing mission in the state. <laughs> and uh, I did contribute to this mission in France in my former position. And uh, I want to add in your to your description that uh, open source and commons are also communities and communities that share a lot of values and goals with the government itself because they, they are dedicated to general interest. And that's, you can build alliance with them. And in France, we, we made some, some very important projects of successes with the communities. For example, we did fix a very important issue of, uh, we, need, we, we did need one database, open source, of course, open data of the geographical uh, position of every postal addresses, which is very important for a lot of uh, public services. And we did this with OpenStreetMap because the National Geographic Institute alone could not do this. And in France, we have the chance to have 1 million contributors to OpenStreetMap. So together, we are very, very strong. And I, I, I wanted to, to, to say this, you, you, the perspective of the alliance between the state and the communities of commoners is very, very uh, prom promising. So I did speak about this, so maybe I don't have time to speak about education. De de let's decide, please. I'm so sorry, I didn't catch that. Could you just repeat the last sentence? No, I said uh, I did use my time to speak about this alliance between communities. So well, if you want, I give you the floor back. Do you know, I think Marcel, being the gentleman that he is, he's still en route. So I mm -hmm. think we can use a bit of his time. I'm sure he'd be happy with that. So if you mm -hmm. want to elaborate on, on that, um, and then also this point about uh, empowering the citizen in in because we talk a lot about default open policy. Um, oh, yes, that's another go. important thing. Um, yeah, I come with the man. Welcome, Marcel. So, Ambassador, um, maybe you want to just finish your finish your comment, and then we'll we'll bring um, uh, Marcel into discussion. Mm. Thanks. No, you did trick me uh, slightly about education. Uh, that's another important aspect, but. Um, I do observe that everywhere, everyone uh, wants, of course, to digitalize the educational system. But very often, we are just teaching new consumers. We teach to the students to, to use uh, resources. And from my perspective, uh, teaching to our children to be contributors, to be active. And I quote very often the famous quote, don't teach them to surf, teach them to make waves. That's very important uh, for them as future citizens, but also for our global prosperity, because if we are not part of the creative movement, we'll be just followers. So I, and here, uh, again, an alliance with uh, the open source and commons communities can be very, very efficient. Thank you, Ambassador. So um, welcome, Marcel. Um, it's great to see you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're not, the beads of sweat have, have evaporated. Uh, you've been driving um, ferociously through check, check uh, traffic, but welcome. Um, I'm gonna bring you straight in on, on a point which uh, we were talking about earlier about, about commons um, and, and the interaction with, uh, interplay with open source and so forth. Um, uh, actually, before I do so, it must be feel a bit weird coming back here as a former student. Uh, I wonder whether when you were sitting here as a student, did you ever think one day I'll be sitting here as an MEP? Weird thought. <laughs> so yes, no. I think the, 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 your your position as being uh, one of the one of the leading MEPs on this particular, uh, um, um, I suppose, technology, but also deeper than just the the, the code, the understanding. I, I would think you're quite unique in the Parliament with regards to that background, that that expertise. So looking at it um, for your last sort of three years in in Parliament, and what's your sort of take on sort of Europe's political understanding? Of digital sovereignty and, and the extent to which open source is, is is really understood as being absolutely key to um, unlocking that digital decade which we all talk about very often and hand you the microphone uh, welcome good to see you nice to see you too um sorry for the late arrival but um yeah highways in the czech republic uh, <laughs> uh yeah not only as a um, student even though when i studied here this didn't really exist um but also um seeing your red hat <laughs> also worked at red hat before uh, i got elected in the european parliament so quite a familiar 
uh, environment for me. Um, so on one hand, I would say that um, it is recognized that the potential of open source is um, enormous and that you can see even in um, studies uh, commissioned by the European Commission where uh, one of it says, uh, when it speaks about the potential uh, that um, a 10% increase in contributions to open source uh, would generate up to 0.6% of the EU's GDP. Um, also, when you look at the digital decade targets um, set by the European Commission, then you will find that um, EU businesses and citizens should be empowered when using digital tools. And of course, who is best positioned um, who else is best positioned than open source to actually empower uh, citizens and businesses because it really gives them the control over uh, their data and over their technology. Uh, on the other hand, it is still difficult to somehow um, convince a majority of policymakers that you can achieve um, these goals by the transparency that free and open source software um, uh, delivers and offers uh, rather than using closed proprietary solutions. And some resistance also comes um, from the history of ICT procurement uh, contract frameworks that um, apparently prefer uh, by design um, proprietary solutions and then slow down the change towards um, open source in ICT. So, so in my experience as an MEP, um, I was for two and a half years vice president of the European Parliament for ICT. I'm now the quester of the European Parliament for I ICT. Um, I'm not going to dive into the details <laughs> of the difference between the two roles, but um, as a bureau member focused on ICT, I see a lot into how um, ICT works in the European Parliament. And again, on one hand, uh, there is uh, it is politically acknowledged uh, that open source software is valuable and should be deployed. And in, in many respects, you can see that, that uh, applications developed internally are based on open source software. The backbone of um, the infrastructure often runs open source software, but um, then when it comes to uh, some other systems, you, you still see the difficulty and hesitance, uh, and some sort of resistance, I would even say, uh, to use free and open source software. It is the case for, you know, technologies that you use every day, like email, but also um, in um, when, when you when you look to the future, because yeah, there is a strategy to move to the cloud, and it looks like that the Parliament opts out for Microsoft and Amazon solutions. Um, despite the weaknesses that these solutions entail for data management and for data protection, um, for um, basically being in control of the data. So there I would argue that um, hybrid cloud solutions that um, enable you to be more in control of your data are much better fit uh, for, um, for uh, institutions like that. So what can be done to improve it? So every, every MEP, every member of the European Parliament has uh, the opportunity to initiate or to propose initiation of a so-called pilot project. What is a pilot project? Pilot project is a um, um, project with budget from the European Commission's budget. And if that is approved um, by the European Parliament, uh, then the European Commission has to actually run the project with the budget that was allocated to that. Um, I have initiated a pilot project uh, that I always forget the name, but it is Free and Open Source Software Solutions for European Public Services, POSIPS, um, and it's run by the European Commission. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and um, it consists in creating a European uh, open source application catalog. So basically, um, it, it tries to uh, bridge 
the burden um, between free and open source projects and free and open source solutions and the administration that, well, many times would like to use them, but they don't actually really know uh, what to do. And the number of different catalogs that are out there is, um, you know, the way how this is set up, they are rather scattered. So it's good to bridge this gap with some one catalog that basically bridges all of these catalogs that are all out there together. And I have also recently proposed a pilot project uh, um, uh, to be again run by the European Commission, where the aim is to demonopolize the access to EU applications. So uh, the EU institutions, they have a lot of um, um, applications that you can install on your phone, for instance, uh, to make it easier for you to work with the institutions. But no wonder um, they are all available on um, the major uh, uh, Google Play and Apple App Store. The, the aim of this pilot project that I hopefully uh, would be adopted is uh, to make these applications available also on open source repositories like FDroid to also um, de demonopolize the access to uh, these applications. And I would also like to mention that recently uh, the EDPS, the European Data Protection uh, Supervisor, launched a project um, is called EU Voice and EU Video. And these are nothing else basically than uh, instances of Mastodon and PeerTube uh, decentralized open source social networks. Um, the project, I was told, would um, soon transition um, under the auspices of the European Commission and be run um, as a permanent project by the European uh, Commission. I think this is a really great step, again, towards adopting uh, free and open source software. So, so to wrap it up, on one hand, I would say um, quite some resistance that you can see, but also there are individual steps that are being done that are very promising for the future. Thank you, Marcel. Um, I appreciate we've got five minutes left. Um, Am I right? No. Oh, we've got 10 minutes left. Thank you, that man. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, yes, I, I think maybe um, putting, since it's a fireside chat, um, I'd like to perhaps put some petrol on the fire um, and talk about um, the sort of 800 pound gorilla in the room, this EU recovery fund. I think a couple of days ago, Commissioner van der Leyen was talking about how only 100 billion has been spent of 800 billion. Um, and there was a you know growing rising sense of frustration in Brussels. I, I sense that that's possibly the case also at a capital level, um, given that uh, unfortunately our ge geopolitical and economic situation isn't getting any better. Um, and yet this digital decade uh, objective still still remains. So I'd be interested in hearing <clears throat> uh, your opinions, all three of you, um, on that on that discussion um, and how that that's uh, that's panning out. Probably I'll go to you, Mr. Profond, first, if I may. Thank you. Oof, the record I found. Uh, uh, in Czech Republic, we have a problem with recovery fund. Uh, uh, because our recovery pl plan was uh, planned by the previous government, and now we have uh, problem to change the project or change the criteria. We, of course, we can change the project itself, but not the criteria. So if the criterion is something, sorry for the word, but stupid, like uh, to buy a proprietary product, or it's it's not so easy, but in, in some way uh, this, uh, we cannot change it. And we are fighting with that and of course as i previous mentioned uh, we haven't the digital agency so we have we have no our own uh, quality workforce to uh, to refactor this project so we have a lot of projects but uh, a lot of uh, are for my point of view ineffective investments in software model and current vendor lock-ins. Uh, it's, uh, it's really hard to 
changes in a, in a, the real operation and uh, and uh, and of course we we need a lot of this project there are some e-health projects for example but uh, there are no uh, and in Czech Republic there are no open source infrastructure in health or uh, data exchange standards in health we are working on data exchange standards but uh, they will come after this project so it's uh, it's really not i'm not really optimistic about the results of course we do a lot of things we prepare uh, we can buy some hardware we can uh, improve uh, some softwares uh, but uh, there will be no open source revolution for the from from the recovery plan plan yeah uh, one one uh, one positive thing is that we have in our recovery plan uh, uh, center center of competence that uh, where we can hire experts and share experts across the public sector so we have a uh, center like this uh, in uh, we, we will have in uh, the one and another in health uh, or in the ministry of health so there are of course some positive aspects but uh, it's it's uh, quite bureaucratic and it's not uh, easy for the for the starting government to change all the uh, decisions uh, made by previous government uh, thank you. Um, if I may just pass that on, that question to you, Ambassador Delio, speak to us from Paris. Thank you. Thanks. So regarding the recovery plan. Yes. Okay. I can say two things um, because they, they might be two two parts. Uh, regarding the economic recovery, we don't have a specific open source uh, approach because uh, here we are trying to to help small businesses and small companies and they have the, the freedom of a strategy we ex we hope that they know because um, in france we are trying to rebuild the tech ecosystem for decades so we know that they have a, a good level of uh, strategic uh, vision regarding the state it's a bit different because uh, we we inject also a lot of money in the governmental infrastructure and here we have a uh, quite uh, open source by default policy because we do encourage a lot to buy uh, or to observe or, or to first uh, to be able to notify why you didn't decide to, to to build on open source and i mentioned it on the other side we have a uh, the other open source by default approach everything that the government build has to be open source so we share all of our codes too and that can be interesting too for the communities. So uh, we can expect that the recovery plan will, uh, in the, the governmental part, will be helpful for this vision. Thank you. That was um, enlightening. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Marcel. In fact, this is going to be the last intervention. And then um, if I could ask all three speakers to perhaps just um, uh, consolidate. Uh, um, a, a statement um, on this particular uh, sort of high-level discussion theme, which I think we would uh, enjoy, appreciate as a as a takeaway from this far side. So, Marcel, floor yours. On the same question. Yeah. yeah. So um, I haven't looked too much into the particular implementation um, of uh, the recovery fund in uh, in the Czech Republic. Um, nevertheless. Um, the important thing is that there uh, is a share that needs to be used for digitization. That's good. The problem is, of course, um, how we actually implement it. And then, uh, of course, member states have the opportunity to use it well, but they can also use it in a wrong way. So uh, that's, I'm coming back a bit to what Anze said. Um, but so my take from that is that. I would prefer 
uh, that already on the high level de definition that comes from the European level, we would already have um, incentives that would incentivize the use of uh, free and open source software and, and preference for open source solutions because we also know that they are valuable for our society because they can be reused, they can be recycled. Um, um, people can collaborate on that, companies can collaborate on that. Um, by definition, the data that it produces are open data and so on. So that I think is a mi missing piece uh, that could have uh, been done better. But as I said in the very beginning uh, of my speech, we really still have room for improvements to actually convince policymakers how important the stress on free and open source solutions is. Uh, thank you. So, sort of final few minutes of this fireside chat. Ambassador, um, you want to uh, kick us off and then we'll go in this direction and finish with Marcel at the end. Thank you. Yes, I was wondering. So, I want to share with you a view. Uh, I may not make only friends, but I think that this is very important. Sometimes there is like a confusion because w when you think about open source, you think about one very important economic sectors with companies and that are very important for sovereignty and everything. But you think also about a broader movement with open standards, with contribution. And you did hear me in my words. For me to teach to, to children to contribute to Wikipedia or OpenStreetMap, to teach to government to share their own uh, source code, etc., is a part of a bigger plan because we want to to reopen and uh, to the, the, mov the global empowering machine of the digital revolution. And so I want to share with, with you that this is not just an industrial policy, and we have to to work with both sides, companies and non-profit organization, and that's very important from my perspective. Okay, I have only. Uh, quite short message. I think uh, open source is great open opportunity corresponding to with main goals and visions of the European Union, like freedom of knowledge, citizen centric, decentralized, and many more. So it's on us to support open source to promote in the independent and free society. Right. So um, again, to the beginning of my speech. Uh, there is still room for improvement. Uh, there is a lot of room for improvement. But also, we will not be able to fill in that room for improvement with actual improvement if we don't do individual steps. So I don't think that we can underestimate the impact of the individual steps that are being done in the right direction. Some of them I have already mentioned. And uh, I would like to add also that in various uh, legislative files uh, that uh, the, uh, the European institutions produce in the legislative process, there can, st there can be done a lot of these little steps. So for instance, I will give you one example. Um, this year, we have adopted the Digital Markets Act, uh, which is a legislation that should um, give more control into uh, people's hands over their data by actually creating more competition on the markets because we don't have a level playing field. We have large uh, corporations like Google, uh, Facebook, Amazon that control large portion of digital markets. And within this legislation, I managed to, um, uh, to, to sneak in an obligation for the so-called gatekeepers uh, to uh, enable interoperability for chat platforms, which means that the smaller players, those who very often are free and open source software, like Matrix, for instance, they can become interoperable with these large solutions. And that would make it easier for citizens to change from uh, these uh, solutions of these large companies to free and open source solutions because they could switch from, uh, let's say, WhatsApp to Matrix and still be uh, in touch with their friends that are um, at WhatsApp. 
So this is just an example, but I think this is exactly the way how we should uh, proceed step by step uh, to improve and to incentivize uh, the use and development in free and open source software. Thank you very much. And actually on that note of thanks, would you join me in the usual way to show our appreciation of our wonderful fireside chat? Thank you.